Hello, and welcome to our educational video, Lupus and Women's Health, From Puberty to Menopause. I'm Annika Hazlitt, a member of the Board of Directors at Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus, and your host. Lupus is a chronic autoimmune disease that affects nine times as many women as men. It also affects women differently at different times in life. Today, we are fortunate to have two experts on lupus and women's health, Dr. Don Thomas and Tatiana Spiegler. Dr. Thomas is a licensed rheumatologist at Arthritis and Pain Associates of Prince George's County and the author of the Lupus Encyclopedia, a comprehensive guide for patients and families. Tatiana Spiegler is a registered nurse and patient engagement liaison with GSK. She brings a wealth of information for women managing lupus at all stages of life. Before we hear from our experts, we'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, GSK, for their generous support in making this event possible. So now, let's hear from Dr. Don Thomas. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction and thank you for being here today for my talk about lupus and women's health, puberty to menopause. But before I jump into all of the interesting information, I'd first like to tell you about one of my patients. This is a photograph of my patient named Jill. And by the way, I'm going to talk about several patients of mine, and I'm going to change the names, and the photographs are not really them, but they kind of look similar to what they look like. But when I first met Jill, and when I was a rheumatology fellow at Walter Reed Army Medical Center, she was only 13 years old. I come to the bedside, and she would look so sick. And she told me how during the past few weeks, she had all at once got real sick with high fevers. She was got very fatigued, her joints were hurting, and then she got these sores all in her mouth and a rash on her face, and she just didn't feel good at all. As I was talking to her, by the way, it was I, one thing that really struck me is that she had a lot of difficulty talking to me and remembering things, but she was able to tell me uh, most of her history at least. And then on physical exam, she had horrible sores all over her lips. Her lips were swollen, her eyes were swollen, sores in her mouth. She had the classic butterfly rash and she had a lot of arthritis. But the worst thing is that on her laboratory work, and she, it showed that she did have systemic lupus, by the way, with a high positive anti-nuclear antibody, anti-double-stranded DNA, low complement levels. But she had a lot of protein in her urine and her kidney function was horrible. We did a, a, a kidney biopsy and she unfortunately had severe lupus nephritis. Nephritis, meaning that it was attacking her kidneys. So we treated her with high doses of steroids, a chemotherapy called cyclophosphamide, and hydroxychloroquine, which all lupus patients should be on. So we'll talk about several different things related to this case. First, um, is Jill's severe systemic lupus is this typical of someone her age? Also, why are there more Jills than Jacks who have systemic lupus erythematosus? There's a lot more women who have lupus than there are men. And then as Jill gets older, what kind of things should I be recommending that Jill do in order to keep her health going well? And then there's a big perception that lupus gets better after women go through menopause. But is that really true? When Jill goes through menopause, will her lupus get a lot better? And then how about those women who develop lupus after they go through menopause. It's not very common, but it does happen, and how do they do? So first we'll talk about how severe systemic lupus is in our pediatric population and in our patients who, as they go through puberty. Well, first off, about 21% of them will get a problem called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Anemia is where the red blood cell count is lower than normal. Most people have heard about iron deficiency, uh, you know, women having um, menstrual cycles, losing blood, and having to take iron. That's one cause of anemia. Anemia means that the red blood cell count is low, and then we have to figure out what the cause of that low red blood cell count is. Um, and in heme autoimmune hemolytic anemia, this is a problem where the immune system attacks the red blood cells, and it actually destroys them. And this can be really severe and life-threatening when this happens. Well, while 21% of children like Jill will develop autoimmune hemolytic anemia, only around 10% or less of adults with lupus will develop 
that problem. Around 20% of our pediatric population will develop low platelet counts, just like Jill had, uh, and this can end up causing severe bleeding problems if it's not treated, while in adults, less than 10% develop this type of problem from their lupus. Around a third of our pediatric population now have a problem where lupus attacks the lining of their lungs and their heart as a condition called serositis. The, uh, the serosa are sacs where an organ is inside of it that moves and then it acts like lubrication. Uh, and this happens with the, uh, the heart and the lungs as they uh, move with the beating of the heart or as we breathe in and breathe out with the lungs. But when lupus attacks that lining, then it can cause pain as the person breathes in and as they breathe out. Uh, we call it pleurisy as a very common uh, name for that. And it can be incredibly painful. While a third of our pediatric patient population develops it, only around 11 to 18 percent of our adults do. So again, about half uh, to a third of the time does it happen in adults. Around 42 percent of our pediatric population that detects the brain. And in Jill's case, I didn't mention it, but we did a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture. And she had a ton of white blood cells in, in the cerebrospinal fluid telling us that her lupus was attacking the brain and possibly the, around the spinal cord, something that we call meningitis. And then the worst thing in our pediatric population like happened with Jill is when it attacks the kidneys or what we call lupus nephritis. Anywhere from 60% to 75% of our pediatric patient population develop lupus nephritis. I remember when I was at Walter Reed, we had a large um, pe pediatric uh, lupus patient population. We would get um, children from all over the world from uh, military service members, and they almost always had lupus nephritis. But it only happens in 20% to 30% on average of adult white lupus patients uh, like Jill. Jill was Caucasian. So it's a huge difference with the severity of lupus that unfortunately our, our younger patient population develops. And then there's the question of why are there more Jills than Jacks? Most of you know that there's a lot more women who have uh, systemic lupus erythematosus than males. And why is that? Well, first it has to do with genes. Lupus and all autoimmune diseases are genetic diseases. You're born with the genes that cause the disease. There's 23 different sets of chromosomes. There's, uh, they come in pairs, and one of those pairs is called our sex chromosomes. And in women, they have an X and an X chromosome, while men have an X and a Y, and they pass these down to their children. And then th they have a 50% chance of having girls and a 50% chance of having a boy every time that they have a baby. Well, this shows the sex chromosomes, and this shows a picture of the X chromosome on your left and the, a Y chromosome on the, on the right. You know, we can get along without a Y chromosome. We don't need that chromosome, but everyone needs the X chromosome. And it has a lot of genes that the Y chromosome does not have to include genes that cause lupus. So just think about it. Women, they get two X chromosomes, so they have a twice as likely to be born with these genes that can cause lupus in the first place compared to men. And then this picture here, it shows a cell that contains the two X chromosomes that I was talking about. Um, the, you see the XI on the top right and the XA on the bottom. The XA stands for the active X chromosome. The one on the top right, that's an inactive X chromosome. The, the body is very good at making sure that, that women don't have too much activity from the genes on the X chromosome. And this actually protects them from getting bad things. You'll see that XI, that inactivated X chromosome on the top. It's surrounded by these red particles, which are RNA, which uh, basically prevent the genes on that X chromosome from being activated. And so we call this X inactivation, and it's a protective uh, measure for women. But around 15% of genes, uh, they escape that inactivation. And lo and behold, a lot of those genes that can do that are the lupus genes. Genes. This slide here shows some genes that are on the X chromosome that that escape that inactivation. So not only do women uh, are twice as likely to be born with lupus uh, genes, but also those particular genes on the X chromosome escape that inactivation and are twice as likely to be active compared to men because they only have that one X chromosome. 
Back in 2014, we only knew of 33 genes that cause lupus, but now, just last year, a paper came out describing over 180 genes that cause systemic lupus. Now, the more genes you're born with, the more likely you are to have lupus. <clears throat> But most people born with the genes that cause lupus never develop the disease. And it's because they need some type of trigger to turn it on. Uh, for example, one of the most common ones that most people know about is the sun. It's not uncommon for someone to go to the beach or go on a cruise to the Caribbean and then come back with a horrible flare or new onset systemic lupus because of the ultraviolet light con uh, causing abnormalities to these genes and turning them on and causing them to attack the person person's body. Epstein-Barr virus, uh, or there's all probably other viruses that do it as well, but, but Epstein-Barr virus seems to be a big culprit in triggering lupus to occur in people who are born with the genes. Low vitamin D levels. Now, the immune system relies upon vitamin D to work properly. Inside of all the white blood cells of the immune system, they have receptors inside of them that attach to vitamin D, and that vitamin D is instrumental in making that white blood cell work normally. But we know in animal models that when we make them go vitamin D deficient, that their immune system becomes abnormal, just like we see in lupus. And we know in our lupus humans, when we give them vitamin D, that it actually helps their vitamin D get better. So this is another trigger for lupus. Cigarette smoking is a big one. We don't know why, but, but in, in, in tobacco, there's a lot of different chemicals and some of them actually cause damage to the proteins around DNA. We call it epigenetics uh, when this occurs and it increases the likelihood of developing lupus. But one of the worst things is that even secondhand smoke does this. Children who grow up in households where there's cigarette smoking, are twice as likely to develop lupus than people who grow up in houses that do not smoke. But then there's estrogen. Estrogen and other female hormones also cause abnormalities of the immune system that increase the risk of developing lupus or of it getting worse. And there's several different ways that it does this. For example, it increases B cell activity. Uh, the B cells are a type of white blood cell. You, everyone watching this who has lupus, you know that you're an ANA positive, anti-nuclear, antibody positive. Some of you have other antibodies like anti-Smith, anti-SSA. Well, it's the B cells that make these antibodies that attack the person's body. And estrogen actually increases B cell activity. They also increase T cell activity. T cells are, are white blood cells that tell the B cells to become more active. It increases dendritic cell activity. Dendritic cells are really important cells that, that recognize abnormal proteins and then tell the T cells and the B cells to become more active. And then they also increase the activity of interferon. Most of you might have heard of 80% of, of lupus patients have too much interferon in their body and estrogen is one of the things that can increase that activity. So, so estrogen is a real big culprit. But also when you look at the women who get lupus, the vast majority of them develop lupus during their childbearing years. This cartoon right here shows the amount of estrogen that women have at, at different decades in their life, starting with 20 years old on the left and 80 years old on the right. Uh, the uh, bright red that you see or the dark red, that represents the, uh, the amount of estrogen inside of those particular women during those stages of life. And look at the 30-year-old person. That's when it's at its maximum. Around the, the late 20s is when there's the most amount of estrogen. And so it's no surprise that lupus is most likely to occur in people who are anywhere from puberty up to around uh, in the late 30s. So those particular times of year when the estrogen is more active. Then look after the age of 30, the estrogen levels are coming down a lot and lupus is less likely to occur at those particular ages. Well, we also know that menstrual cycles can cause lupus to flare and to flare and it probably has to do with those, estro those estrogen levels or the female hormonal levels that increase during those periods. A survey from 2011 of lupus patients showed that one out of every three systemic lupus patients would have flares of their lupus right before or during their menstrual cycles. And so if you're watching this and you see the flare up around the menstrual cycle, it's not in your mind 
mind. There's a real reason why it happens and it is related to your female estrogen hormones. So to summarize, why do women uh, develop lupus more often? Why are there more Jills than Jacks? Number one, it has to do with those uh, lupus genes that are uh, located on the X chromosome. Women are, get a double dose of these uh, lupus genes compared to men because we have an X and a Y instead of two X chromosomes. Some genes that cause lupus are on the X chromosome and then they escape inactivation. They're supposed to become quiet. Uh, you know, one X is supposed to, to stay active, the other one's supposed to stay quiet, but those genes on that one inactivated X chromosome, they're just super chromosomes and, they, and they're active and they can end up causing lupus. So it's a double whammy against women. Women with that. And then finally, there's the female hormones. Estrogen plays a big role in causing lupus to be more active or to occur in the first place. So the next question is, what should I recommend to Jill as she gets older, when she gets into her 20s, 30s, 40s? Uh, besides just uh, treating her lupus, are there other things that I should be doing with her? And the answer is absolutely yes. She'll probably come of age at one point where she may want to become pregnant. And pregnancy, you know, 30, 40 years ago, we used to tell our patients with systemic lupus, the vast majority of them, we would tell them, please don't get pregnant because you you're going to be at very high risk of your lupus becoming severely active and losing that baby. But today, with proper planning, the vast majority of our patients can have a successful pregnancy. And if they do it correctly, most of them can even have a pregnancy reaching the rates of what people without lupus can have, but it takes some extra planning. In 2020, the American College of Rheumatology released really helpful and important guidelines that, that guide us physicians into knowing what to tell our patients to prepare them for pregnancy and to help them have a successful pregnancy. But the good news is that you, as the lupus patient, can do a lot of these on your own. And these are things that I would teach Jill, but also Jill can learn. Uh, if you go to my website, thelupusencyclopedia.com, I do have a, a blog post or an article all about how you can have a successful pregnancy. Just go to lupusencyclopedia.com and just type a search for pregnancy. But it has a list of do's and don'ts on things you can do to have that success successful pregnancy. But also it's important not to become pregnant at certain times. For getting pregnant, we always want our, our lupus patients to be in very good control for at least six months before they try to have a baby. So using contraception is really important in lupus patients. And you have a, you have a large array of things that you can choose from to become pregnant. Some are much more um, likely to prevent pregnancy than others, and some are a lot safer than others for lupus patients. And so for lupus patients, how about oral contraceptive pills? Should they take the pill uh, to prevent pregnancy or not? Well, most lupus patients probably should not. And the reason for this is that the most common cause of death in lupus patients are heart attacks and strokes. And one possible complication of oral contraceptive pills is that they have such high levels of, of estrogen in them that they can potentially cause strokes and heart attacks. But especially in our patients with something called antiphospholipid antibodies. Anywhere from 30% to 50% of systemic lupus patients will have these antibodies and you should ask your doctor if you're positive for them or not and you should have been tested for them. They include anticardiolipin antibody, lupus anticoagulant, and uh, beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibody. So make sure to ask your doctor if you're positive for that and you should absolutely not take uh, the pill if, you're, if you have those antibodies. But the one that we recommend the most is the IUD. That's by far the safest and most effective. It's over 95% effective in, in preventing pregnancies and is safe for almost all lupus patients. Make sure to ask your rheumatologist first, of course, but if you go with the IUD, usually you're very safe with doing that and it's, and it's very effective as well. And so I would also teach Jill about other things. You know, after you get through all the bad stuff with lupus the first few years, the most common causes of death in our patients are actually heart attacks and strokes. They happen about 20 years earlier than they should in, in adults with lupus, 
But in our pediatric population, they develop these things oftentimes in their 20s and 30s. And so I would teach her about exercising regularly, probably put her on a statin or a cholesterol lowering medication, monitor her blood pressure and make sure to keep it perfectly normal, make sure she's eating a good heart healthy or anti-inflammatory diet. So that's very important. Uh, the other important thing that I didn't put a slide up on is preventing infections. Infections are the second most common cause of death. So I'd want her to make sure that she has all of her vaccinations, like for the flu and for pneumonia, uh, for COVID-19, for example. Uh, but also I'd want her to have the Gardasil uh, vaccine against human papillomavirus. You know, our lupus patients, when they're first diagnosed with lupus, they're much more likely to be infected with human papillomavirus and to get cancer from those viruses. And getting the Gardasil at the age of 19 to 11 can help prevent that from happening. Think of it as an anti-cancer vaccine. There's more and more evidence now that living a healthy lifestyle can help the immune system. Eating an anti-inflammatory diet, like making sure that there's omega-3 fatty acids like walnuts and cold water fishes in her diet. Um, making sure that she's exercising regularly. Getting at least eight hours of sleep at night. A study came out showing that, uh, that having a lack of sleep increases the risk of lupus flares, but also even developing lupus in the first place. Family members of people who, um, who uh, had less than seven hours of sleep at night were shown to be much more likely to develop lupus than people who got a full night's sleep. Stress has been shown more and more to cause lupus flares. So I would want to teach her stress reduction techniques, such as practicing mindfulness. Like you see the woman here on the slide looking like she's doing yoga, which is a type of mindfulness. But just doing breathing exercises five to ten minutes a day, there's some evidence that Practicing the mindfulness and breathing exercises has positive benefits for the immune system, but also decreasing stress may also decrease lupus flares as well. There's so many things that lupus patients should remember to do. There's a lot of do's and don'ts, much more than just taking medicines. It's a much more complicated disease than that. And because of that, I came up with a list of do's and don'ts called the lupus secrets. I call them secrets not because I want them to be secrets, but because most patients and doctors don't know about them. Uh, it's very easy to find my list of the lupus secrets, but I would teach Joe to do all of these. And I'd encourage you, the watcher, to also uh, abide by these. Just go to my website, lupusencyclopedia.com, uh, and you can go right to the lupus secrets page and just print them out. And what I recommend that people do is sit down, read them, take a yellow highlighter, highlight everything you didn't realize you should be doing and try to do everything on that list for the rest of your life. Well, well, Jill, she was really good at following my lupus secrets. So remember Jill, she was incredibly sick when I first met her. We treated her with high doses of steroids, cyclophosphamide, hydroxychloroquine, and then I stayed at Walter Reed Army Medical Center for about five years and she just ended up being a wonderful patient. She's one of my most compliant patients. You know, it's very hard for teenagers or to get teenagers with lupus to take their medicines regularly and so forth. But she did everything just perfectly. And when I left the Walter Reed Army Medical Center in 1998, this is kind of what Jill looked like. She was just a very healthy teenager. You couldn't tell that there was anything wrong with her, though she was taking a lot of medicines every day to, to help out with her lupus. So she really is truly a success story. And if I stayed at Walter Reed, I would teach her all those things I talked about in the previous slides. But how about when Joe goes through menopause? So hopefully she'll be around. She, she has a, a, a high chance of living a long lifespan and a normal lifespan if she does all the right things. But there's a perception that when women go through menopause that their lupus not, might get better. But is that really true? Well, they've done studies to look like, to look at this, and when you look at a large patient population, it does appear that women who with lupus who have gone through menopause on average have milder disease than those who have not gone through menopause. But there's a big st statistical problem with that. And that's because younger people 
with lupus tend to have tend to have more severe lupus and because of that they're unfortunately at higher risk of dying and so when you look at the patients who have gone through menopause automatically you have what we call a biased population uh, there we're missing those patients who had the most severe lupus because they have already passed away and so the statisticians they really don't know if if menopause actually makes lupus get better or not we still need studies to tell us one way or the other. So how about those women who develop lupus after they go through menopause? It doesn't happen very often, but, but what is their lupus like? Is it any different? Well, we call it late onset lupus. Uh, late onset lupus uh, in men, we define it as being more than 50 years old. For women, we define it as uh, women who have already gone through menopause when they develop lupus. Well, 20% of all uh, lupus patients develop lupus while they're teenagers or younger. Uh, so that's interesting. When we look at our adult patient population, 20% of them were children when they developed their lupus. But the vast majority, 65% of lupus patients, they develop it during those childbearing years. And only around 15% of lupus patients develop it after they go through menopause or after the age or after the age of 50, coinciding with the when those estrogen levels are much lower. So women with late onset lupus, uh, they tend to have a more slow onset disease. Remember back with Jill, hers happened over just a couple of weeks. She got very sick very quickly. But in our older population, most of them uh, have aches and pains or arthritis as their main problem. Fatigue is a common problem. It comes on slowly. Well, that's a problem. You know, I'm 60 years old and I have aches and pains because of just getting older and degenerative arthritis. And so these people with late onset lupus, they oftentimes have a significant delay in their diagnosis because of the slow onset and because of aches and pains being the primary problem. It's also interesting that there's three women for every man who, who develops lupus in this, in this particular age group. Compare that to nine women to every man during childbearing years. So again, it has to do with the, the lack of those female hormones after the age of 50 or after menopause. They also tend to have milder disease. When we look at systemic lupus patients in the childbearing years, on average, about 45% of them will develop lupus nephritis where it attacks the kidneys. But this happens only about 20% of people with late onset lupus, so it does tend to be milder. They also tend to have other problems more commonly, such as weight loss, loss of appetite or anorexia. They tend to have pleurisy more often, so the, the pain with breathing in because of inflammation around the, the heart and the lungs. And they also tend to have lung in, inflammation or what we call interstitial lung disease or pneumonitis more often. There's another systemic autoimmune disease called Sjogren's disease. Sjogren's disease uh, is a problem where the immune system attacks the glands and they start to secrete less fluids and it can be really a, a life-altering problem when this happens. While our older patients, they tend to get Sjogren's disease along with their lupus a lot more often than our younger patients. So how about hormone replacement therapy? When women go through menopause, they can have really bad problems with quality of life related to horrible hot flashes, uh, moodiness, weight gain, and, and all of those problems. And we try to stay away from hormone therapy, estrogen and progesterone uh, therapy, uh, be, uh, which can help out a lot with those symptoms, by the way, but they can also have possible problems with heart attacks and other problems. Um, and so we try to put our patients on other medicines like gabapentin, uh, some anti depressants uh, such as Prozac can be very helpful as well. But in some women, those symptoms are so severe that other treatments don't help. And so the, the, the benefits can outweigh the risk in those particular women. So we do use hormone replacement therapy in some women with postmenopausal problems. But there's a problem with that is that the estrogen amounts in, the, in the, those therapies are high enough that it, they can possibly trigger mild to moderate flares in some lupus patients. So we do try to stay away from them. But we have the problem where the quality of life could be so severe because of postmenopausal problems that taking those hormones 
might be more beneficial than the possibility of a mild flare. So we do sometimes give uh, systemic lupus patients hormone replacement therapy to help them with their menopausal symptoms after a very careful discussion about the possible pros and cons of those therapies. The another problem with late onset lupus and also our lupus patients as they get older is aging organs. Younger organs can tolerate inflammation a lot better than older organs. So our organs, as we get older, if they get inflammation from lupus, they're much more likely to develop permanent organ damage compared to younger organs. So that's a, another big problem with late onset lupus is that even though their lupus is much more mild, they can actually have more severe organ damage because of the aging organs not tolerating that inflammation nearly as well. So it's incredibly imperative that our older patients with lupus especially work hard on those lifestyle changes like making sure they eat a heart healthy diet, an anti-inflammatory diet. I want them to be exercising 150 minutes a week of moderate aerobic exercise. I want their blood pressure to be perfect. I want them to work on their cholesterol with statins because I want them to have good blood flow to those aging organs and keep them as healthy as possible. You know, one of the wonderful things about being a rheumatologist and taking care of lupus patients is that we do have patients that we take care of for many, many years. We develop very close relationships with our patients. And this card that you see here, we oftentimes get nice gifts of food and, and thank you cards like this. This came from one of my patients I had been following for 20 years. And she followed my lupus secrets perfectly. She, she did amazing with her lupus. But then one, day, one time when I saw her, she was flaring up with arthritis and rashes and a lot of inflammation. And I asked her, well, do you have any idea why you might be flaring? And she could, and, oh, and, and at this time I was able to check hydroxychloroquine drug levels, by the way, and her hydroxychloroquine drug level was very low. And I said, are you, are you, you must be missing doses of your hydroxychloroquine. And she said, yes, Dr. Thomas, I have been missing doses because on my bottle, the pharmacist put on there that I had to take it with food. And so I, I haven't been eating regularly the, the past few months. And so I was, have been missing a lot of doses of my hydroxychloroquine. And so I just reminded her, please, before you do anything like that, please ask me because you don't have to take hydroxychloroquine with food. It just makes it easier on the stomach, but you can take it if you don't eat. Um, and so please start taking that hydroxychloroquine religiously. I gave her a, a, a corticosteroid or cortisone shot in the buttocks so it could go through the whole body to calm down inflammation. That's one of the safest ways to treat flares. She started to take her hydroxychloroquine religiously. She quickly went back into remission. So I got this card and I'll just like to read part of the card to you. So she put on here, this has been a wake up call for me and I really enjoy having you as, as my doctor. You really care about your patients, which I do. God has kept me here with your help and I want to, and I want to live for a long time. No one has lived in my family past the age of 60 years old. One thing about her, she had a lot of genetics for lupus. Most family members had severe lupus and no one lives past the age of 60. Well, guess what? She was 73 years old when she gave me this card. And so that just really proves how patients can take things in under their own control and, and, and battle this disease and do better than they can, more so than just taking the medicines. And that's kind of what she looks like. Um, she's a very happy, a very healthy looking woman, even though she has this horrible disease that she's been dealing with with all these years. And, she's, and now she's 75 years old, but she has a great chance of living into her 80s and her 90s. Today, I actually have two patients with severe, systemic lupus in their 90s and I have another patient who's going to turn 90 in a couple of years. So the wonderful news about today is that our patients are living much longer.
because you have so much more things that you can do to keep your disease under control. We have more, more drug therapies that have been found to be helpful. Um, we know that things like controlling stress, eating an anti-inflammatory diet, exercising can help our patients as well. So I hope that you can understand by, by listening to me today that lupus, unfortunately, affects women a lot more often than men. And it has to do with those X chromosomes, the hormones, but there are things you, you can do to control your lupus better. So just remember, if you put these things into practice with the lupus secrets, you can learn to control lupus and not let lupus control you. And please consider going to the kaleidoscopefightinglupus.org website. They have a lot of wonderful articles that you can read that can help guide you through your, your lupus journey and learn how to, to deal with lupus yourself. So please join Kaleidoscope so that you can learn more. And thank you very much for, for watching this. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. As always, really great information. Next, we will hear from Tatiana Spiegler, who will discuss the physical and emotional challenges of living with lupus for women, especially in the teen years. Welcome, Tatiana. Thank you, Annika, for that introduction. And thank you, Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus, for this collaboration and for all that you do to bring reliable information to those living with lupus. I'm Tatiana Spiegler. I'm a patient engagement liaison with GlaxoSmithKline and today we're gonna to be talking about teens and lupus. Being a teenager is really hard. Your body's changing and you're becoming independent. Some teenagers are starting to make their own choices and learning about consequences. And then we have those teenagers that maybe were diagnosed as children with lupus or newly diagnosed with lupus. And teenagers with lupus may have some unique and important concerns. So today we'll explore some of these areas and what you as a teen or maybe a caregiver of a teen can do. Remember this presentation doesn't replace talking to your doctor. So I recommend that you take notes and write down your questions so you can discuss them with your doctor during your next visit. Lupus is one of the many illnesses that are considered chronic. And let's talk about chronic illnesses overall. About 2 million children and teens in the US have a chronic health condition. That's about 6% of people who are ages 10 through 18. And these conditions can't be cured, but they can be controlled. And usually symptoms for these chronic conditions can last more than three months or longer. They can also limit daily activities and cause disabilities. During the teenage years, your body, your brain, and your behavior go through a lot of changes. Your height and your weight may also change and you'll gain maturity from your own personal identity and grow intellectually. Managing your chronic illness will take an extra level of attention from you and your caregiving team. Only a small portion of patients with lupus are diagnosed before the age of 16. That's only about 15 to 20%. And while lupus diagnosis at such a young age is rare, is most common in female children of Asian African-American, Hispanic, or Native American descent. And you may often hear the term childhood onset lupus when talking about children and teenagers that have been diagnosed with lupus. Like I said earlier, being a teenager, it's not easy. Your bodies are changing, and for those with lupus, you'll notice how your bodies are gonna experience even more changes as lupus start to impact many areas of your life. You may have rashes and hair loss that can affect your self-esteem and make you feel bad about yourself. Or maybe you'll develop arthritis, which is when lupus attacks your joints and causes pain in your hands, which can make it really hard for you to type and write. You may also have side effects from medications such as weight gain, acne, and stretch marks. And as we continue, I want to keep one thing in mind. And that's that kids and teens with lupus are more likely to find greater social support and feel more empowered than adults who are diagnosed with lupus. Plus, there's so many ways to find support through your healthcare team, your friends, and your family. And lupus affects your body differently than it would an adult. Some symptoms experiences are very similar, while 
others may be more severe for you. So let's talk about a few parts of your body that lupus may affect. Let's start with the skin, which is the most noticeable one. And you may develop skin rashes. The most common is the malar rash or the butterfly rash. It's seen in the majority of children and teens with lupus. This rash goes over the cheeks, across the nose, and sometimes all the way to the ears in the form of a butterfly. Lupus can affect your muscles and your bones, also known as the musculoskeletal system, causing pain, inflammation, and when we talk about inflammation, we're talking about swelling or stiffness in your joints. Lupus can affect the kidneys because it causes inflammation in your kidneys. And when those symptoms progress, it can lead to lupus nephritis. Lupus nephritis is one of the most common and most serious complications of lupus. And this can start very small, like changes to your urinary bathroom habits. Some people start to go more and some people start to go less. So make sure that you're paying attention to your body. Symptoms in the nervous system are more likely to develop within the first two years after your diagnosis. And these include headaches, seizures, anxiety, mood changes, numbness in parts of your body, or cognitive dysfunction. And this last one just means that your brain's struggling to process information, which we also call brain fog. Lupus can also affect your blood and your lungs, which causes changes to your blood cell count, shortness of breath, and that fever. A lot of people with lupus will feel a low-grade fever. They just feel hot inside. And this is not a full list of symptoms you may experience. Just a few I wanted to call out as they occur more often and more seriously in children and teens. And as I'm talking to you, or maybe you're are a parent or a loved one of a teen with lupus and you're identifying or recognizing some of these symptoms, be sure to keep track of the symptoms and share them with their doctor. Lupus can have a lasting impact on the body over time. And since teenagers are diagnosed at such a young age, your body will have a longer fight with lupus. And I'm gonna mention some of the major impacts that you should be discussing with your doctor. You have a higher risk of more severe lupus. Studies have found that children and teens with lupus will experience more active symptoms in their lifetime and may damage the body sooner than most adults. Your kidneys may experience more lupus symptoms over time, and it's believed that 50 to 75% of children with lupus will develop kidney involvement, most of them in the first two years after their diagnosis. So make sure that you talk to your doctor about your kidneys. You may also experience more side effects from taking steroids long-term. More than 90% of children with lupus will receive corticosteroids to help them decrease their immune system's activity and help manage some of the symptoms of inflammation. So if you're having side effects from taking steroids, discuss your concerns and the side effects with your doctor. Something that I do wanna highlight here is that being diagnosed early and following your treatment plan can help reduce the risk of organ damage. And managing lupus during your teenage years can be very challenging. Growing up with lupus may affect your emotions and your mental health. So if you're experiencing anxiety or depression, talk to your doctor and let them know. They can maybe help find ways to help you deal with your emotions. Also, you may consider adding a counselor or a therapist to your healthcare team. And if you're feeling alone or maybe isolated, like no one really understands what you're going through, Look for support from your family and friends. Going to school and participating in extracurricular activities while also sticking to a particular treatment plan and dosing schedule can be very stressful. Always be sure to take your medications on the correct schedule and at the right time, even if you're busy. And if you're feeling hesitant about going to school in general, consider sharing your lupus experience with a friend or your favorite teacher. If they understand what you're going through, then they can have your back. Or maybe you're nervous about having a symptom flare while you're at school, whether that symptom is visible or invisible to others. So I want you to have a plan in place to let your teachers, the front office staff, and the school nurse know, and also alert a friend to get any notes or homework you'll miss. And remember, you're not alone. There may be other kids and teens who are going through the same thing or experiencing something similar. There may even be adults in your life who are battling lupus as well. 
and there are many healthcare professionals who are part of your team. And as a child, you will regularly see a pediatrician or maybe a pediatric rheumatologist. That's just someone who specializes in autoimmune disease in children. And as you get older, however, you'll graduate from a pediatrician to a primary care physician or maybe from a pediatric rheumatologist to an adult rheumatologist. You may also see a nephrologist or many other specialists. A nephrologist is a doctor for the kidneys. And you may have other therapists, pharmacists, and nursing team that will support you. But as you turn 18, you are gonna start looking to find the right primary care physician who understands your lupus. You're also balancing a transition in your education and maybe your home life. Plus, you may be starting to manage your medications and appointments on your own. And this transition is very important to the continued management of your health. This is also a transition period where we see a lot of people struggle in making the change into the offices and doctors that care for adults only. So you can ask your pediatric team to help you in this transition so it can be as seamless as possible for you. Next, I want to share some tips for being proactive in managing your lupus. Make sure that you take time to learn everything you can about lupus, the symptoms, what treatments are out there, and the main terms that your doctor may start using. And when you feel ready to share your lupus, be honest with others. You may talk to your friends, your teachers, your coaches, or others about your diagnosis. And consider practicing how you may explain what lupus is, or maybe what flares are, or the frequent appointments or how lupus affects your life. That feeling of connection and having people who really understand what you're going through, it's very important and it will really help in your well-being. Remember that not everybody knows what lupus is or they may not understand how it affects you. Even your loved ones may take some time to understand what you're going through. Ask for help if you're having a hard day with symptoms. It's okay to ask for help and give yourself a rest. And also be careful if you're committing yourself to too many activities or events. If you're starting to feel like you're exhausted from the day, it's okay to say no. And I know that FOMO is real, the fear of missing out. But with lupus, you have to listen to your body because missing one event may be sad, but having a flare from pushing yourself too hard can set you back even more. And if we remember a flare is when a symptom is really bad and you're having a harder time dealing with lupus. And try to remember to develop and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Get some proper sleep, engage in regular physical activity, and continue to eat healthy. Consider keeping track of your symptoms in a health journal or maybe an app, whatever works for you. So that way you can show your doctor how lupus is affecting your body and your life. And during those appointments, make sure that you're actively participating in the conversation. For example, if your medication schedule is too complicated, talk to your doctor about simplifying it. And when it comes to your medication schedule, make sure you take your medications as prescribed. That means taking the right dose in the right way at the right time. And be mindful that alcohol and recreational drug use can contribute to health issues in teens with chronic illness and may have even negative effects with your medications. And I know that peer pressure is real, so make sure that you stay strong and you find friends that care about your well-being and those that will support your decisions. And if you're the parent or the caregiver of a teen with lupus, there are some ways that you too can be proactive in managing their lupus. You can help your loved one keep track of their symptoms. Maybe that means to check in with them to see how they're feeling. Or you can also help them maintain healthy habits when it comes to nutrition, sleep, and movement. That could include going grocery shopping together, planning an early bedtime, or going for a walk in the evening. And help them practice safe sun care. Prolonged sun exposure can trigger a lupus flare. Teens may be active outdoors, so make sure they're protected with proper clothing. Remember, UV light protective clothing and plenty of sunscreen. If possible, avoid having them going outside from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And also help them keep track of their treatment schedule. Your loved one may have many different medications that have different doses and different times of the day that can be a lot to keep organized. Consider helping them set up a calendar or reminders. Sometimes spill boxes works for people or whatever works for you guys. 
and keep an eye on their emotional health too. Managing lupus can be very challenging, plus the stressors of growing up. And if you're concerned about your teen's mental health, consider adding a therapist or a counselor to their healthcare team. And finally, remember to care for yourself. Caregivers need self-care too. And here we have some QR codes that will take you to some free resources. So grab your phones and point the cameras at the topic that you like to bookmark, or maybe you wanna bookmark all four, but I'm gonna point out my favorite, and that's the first one. It takes you to sign up for a symptom tracking kit from us in Lupus. And this symptom tracking kit includes a symptom checklist, an impact tracker, dictionary of commonly used terms in Lupus, in a journal to collect thoughts. You can find more webinars and resources at gskplacehub.com for people with living with lupus, including teens and their caregivers. And thank you so much for joining us. Never stop learning about lupus. Thank you, Tatiana, for your advice and suggestions to women managing lupus during this critical time in life. This brings us to the end of our symposium, Lupus and Women's Health, From Puberty to Menopause. Once again, a special thanks to our presenting sponsor, GSK, for their generous support in making this event possible. And we want to thank you for watching. We encourage you to visit our website, kaleidoscopefightinglupus.org, and follow our social media platforms for the latest lupus news, program information, award-winning blog articles, and so much more. Thanks for spending time with us. And remember, you are not alone. I'm Annika Hazlitt for Kaleidoscope Fighting Lupus. Please take care.